I'm Anthony Padilla, and I spent a day with kidnapping survivors to uncover the truth about the life-altering effects of vastly different kidnapping experiences. We'll learn the earth-shattering devastation of being kidnapped by a family member and what that does to a child's psyche. And we'll discover the horrifying struggle of escaping a serial killer and the way this tormenting night impacts every element of one's life. Hello, Kara. Hi. Natalia. Hi. By the way, this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. Now, before we get into your full story, can you give us a brief synopsis of your kidnapping? In 2002, when I was 15 years old, I was kidnapped from my best friend's front yard by a stranger. I was held for 18 hours until I escaped, and I found out later that he was a serial killer. 18 years ago, on this day. What? Weird, right? That's very weird. I was gonna wait to tell you until we were filming. I was abducted by my biological father. I was seven years old when I was abducted. My parents were going through a divorce, a mm. really nasty custody battle, and my uncle and my aunt are babysitting me. My dad shows up. He burst in and basically said, I'm gonna take my daughter, I'm going to take her to heaven, and you're never gonna see us again. That's when we basically just started driving mm -hmm. to a theme park. My mom has called the police, uh -huh. and there is an active Amber Alert out for me. The moment happened where I realized that this wasn't a normal day with my dad. While we were on this roller coaster, my dad had lost the necklace that he was wearing, and he just snapped. Mm -hmm. He started like pushing things over at the theme park, mm -hmm. and he was like spitting on windows. That's when he grabbed me and he put me back in the truck. He just started driving the opposite way from home. I was at a friend's house. I had spent the night and her mom asked us to water the plants. Mm -hmm. Went outside, was watering the plants, and a car passed on the way out of the neighborhood. The car pulled back into the driveway. That's kind of weird, but maybe it's someone who knows my friend's mom. Guy gets out of the car. He is very average looking, mm -hmm. white male, comes straight over to me. He said, I have these pamphlets today. I saw you out here and I wanted to give them to you. So he was at least as far apart as we are through yeah. this entire conversation. And so when he reaches in to hand me the pamphlets, he put a gun to the right side of my neck and he said, come with me. And I kind of went, stop. And he goes, no, you're gonna come with me. He walks me around to the driver's side of his car, opens the door and he says, get in. I look in the back seat and there's one of those big plastic containers back yeah. there. And I said, where do I go? And he said, get in the container. So I got in the container, yeah. kind of, you know, like this. He like kind of set the lid on top, got in the car and backed out of the driveway. My brain immediately went into like this analytical mode and all my emotions shut off. I was memorizing, you know, the songs on the radio. There was a serial number on the inside of the container. So I memorized that. There were many things that I memorized and that was just kind of the beginning of me locking in as much information as I could about this person. Wow. And so he drove for about 15 minutes, pulled over to the side of the road. And at that point he put a ball gag in my mouth and uh, put restraints on my wrists and my ankles. He told me to scream as loud as I could, and he said, okay, good. And then put the lid all the way on the container, drove for another minute or two before he stopped the car and then lifted the container with me in it, carried it a short way, set it down and drug it. And I could feel it being drug over concrete and then over a threshold mm. into what I found out was his apartment. He comes to me, he says, okay, I'm gonna take the, the gag out of your mouth. You have to promise not to scream. And you have to remember, I will always have a gun or a weapon of some type. Pretty quickly after I'm there, I begin to notice that there's some things in the apartment mm. that maybe a man wouldn't have. So mm. I'm there for 18 hours. And while I'm there, I at one point was in the bathroom mm -hmm. and I noticed a hairbrush and it had mm -hmm. long red hair in it. Mm -hmm. And I noticed like some feminine hygiene products. So mm -hmm. I realized, okay, a woman spends a decent amount of time here yeah. and she has red hair, right? So mm -hmm. I'm just kind of cataloging all of this information. And he said, um, you're gonna be here for a while and at some point you're going to have to eat. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, I'm not going to eat right now. So is there anything that I can do for you? And he says, 
yeah, sure, you can sweep the kitchen. So I'm like sweeping the kitchen, right? And I use this as like an opportunity to get close to his refrigerator where there's some magnets for like his dentist and his doctor. And so now I know who his dentist and his doctor are and I memorize those things as well. So I'm there for 18 hours. Uh, he sexually assaulted me multiple times while I was there. Mm -hmm. um, he made me watch the news to see if I was on the news and if anyone missed me. Of course, there was nothing there. I had been missing for 11 hours and I was listed as a runaway. And eventually uh, he restrained me to go to sleep. So I had handcuffs on my wrists and then I had a leg restraint on my right leg that was tied to the foot of the bed. And I always expected that while he was sleeping would be my opportunity to escape. Yeah. But at that point, he had also made me smoke marijuana with him and then I had a Valium and I was you know, 15 years old, and I think I was probably like 105 pounds. This is the right? first time you felt any of these right. feelings. Yeah. So obviously I fell asleep. And then I woke up maybe seven and he was still asleep. He was mm -hmm. next to me, he's in the bed next to me. And I realized that that was my opportunity. My dad was just driving really, really recklessly. He was running red lights, he was running stop signs. He just started speaking in tongues. I look back and I see police lights behind us. Part of me was like kind of confused because I always thought that like police were good. Like I didn't understand that they yeah. were after my dad. He wouldn't pull over and one of the police officers rammed the cop car into his truck and caused an accident. The police surrounded the vehicle. They opened his door and pulled him out. He was still speaking in tongues and just completely out of reality. The last thing that happened was the police opening my driver's side door. I was yeah. sitting in the front seat. They pulled me out of the front seat with my seatbelt on. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, they, they're getting choked out. And I'm like, my seatbelt's on, my yeah. seatbelt's on. And they're just trying, you know, to like- Rescue get, you, rescue right? Me. <laughs> yeah. The first thing that I had to do was get my hands out of the handcuffs. Mm -hmm. So I tried to twist my hands, you know, kind of squeeze them out of the handcuffs. And all while he's right next to you? Right. And couldn't squeeze my hands out of the handcuffs. So I tried to unscrew it with my fingers and couldn't. So I had to kind of shimmy my hands up to my mouth and then unscrew it with my teeth. So I unscrewed the quick link, kind of pulled the handcuffs out, and then had to get down to my right leg had to disconnect that restraint from the bed, got out of bed, and then I was able to get one of my wrists out of the handcuffs. Went to the front door, it was more or less barricaded. Every single sound probably sounded like it was the loudest thing in the world in that Absolutely, apartment. and it's a very small apartment, and his bedroom where he's asleep is that like looks out at the front door. So it's literally on the other side of the wall from where I'm trying to escape. You made More. it this far. Right. And now you, you have to be committed because right. if you get found being out, you can't put yourself back in right. that. I somehow am able to kind of shove everything in, open the doors the rest of the way, unlock like, you know, the multiple locks that are on the door and throw the door open. And I know that it's going to wake him up, right? So I know I have exactly one shot at this. Mm -hmm. And I think he's going to wake up He's going to see that I'm not there. He's going to look out, he's gonna hear this, look mm -hmm. out the window and see me running mm -hmm. and shoot me in the back. That's all I could think. Yeah. And I just thought, you know what? It doesn't matter because I'm out and someone will find me and someone will find him. So it doesn't matter. And so I saw a car driving across the parking lot, ran to the driver's side. There were mm -hmm. two men inside. And I said, so I was kidnapped and I escaped from that apartment and turned around and, and pointed to it. And I said, remember that apartment. They said, okay, well, what do you want us to do? Where do you want to go? And I said, take me to the police. The officer that was the one that rescued me, he didn't give me any indication that something traumatic had just happened to me. I really liked that. He just started asking me normal questions as a, as a seven-year-old kid. It wasn't like, I just saved you. Yeah, mm. it, it was like, so what are you learning in school right now? And they took me back to my mom and I'll never forget the look on my mom's face. She was just crying and so happy that I was okay. I was just like so happy to see her. They take me to law enforcement. I'm running through looking for someone. I see no one. And then I hear a voice say, 
ma'am, can I help you? I tell him, my name's Kara Robinson. I was kidnapped and I escaped. And you still have a handcuff on you. Yes, and I do for quite some time. Mm. He'd called my mom and said, you know, Miss Robinson, we have your daughter here. Mm. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm coming. I'll be there as soon as I can. And the investigator arrives. He takes the handcuff off uh -huh. and he says, well, the two gentlemen that brought you in don't remember the apartment you ran out of. And I was like, you had one job. <laughs> like We go back to the apartment complex and we see a man yeah. like works the apartment complex. And I tell him, it's a man. He looks like this. There's a woman that lives there that has long red hair. This is the car that he drives. And he goes, yeah, I'm pretty sure I knew what ap apartment that is. He doesn't know why you're asking at that point. Right. At that point, we go to the hospital to get a sexual assault exam done. And while I'm there waiting for that to be done, is uh, when they actually bring me the photo lineup. They used the um, the description of the car, the doctor, and the dentist, and they cross-referenced all of those and were able to identify my captor from mm. the information that I gave them. I immediately identify him. My captor's yeah. name is Richard Markovonitz, and he is nowhere to be found. His sister more or less sets him up. His sister is supposed to meet him in Florida, lets law enforcement know that she's supposed to meet him, and they set up a covert operation to kind of intercede. And he sees law enforcement, leads them on a short police chase. His car wrecks out of control, basically. They send in a police canine, and the canine bites him on the leg. And either before, during, or after, he puts a gun in his mouth and shoots himself. So I found out the next morning that he had killed himself. And quite honestly, I was pissed off. It didn't give you the relief that no, some people might I was, think. I was pretty angry because yeah. I thought well, he got the easy way out. I wanted to sit across from him in a courtroom and I wanted him to know that choosing me was the biggest mistake he ever made mm -hmm. and that he was outsmarted by a 15 year old. You thought your story was ending when so you many escaped. Times. So many you, you times. Thought, you thought, okay, right. this is it. I'm done. I'm going to be rescued. He's going right. to be captured, and then that's going to be it. Like, I thought when I got out of the bed, okay, great, it's over. thought when I got in the car, okay, they're going to remember the apartment. It's over, right? Yeah. Like, there's so many times when I thought it was going to be over. Whenever law enforcement went into his apartment, they found a locked footlocker that had some newspaper clippings and some other things that they thought a little weird. Mm -hmm. And some of those clippings were from three murders in Virginia from 1996 and 1997. They immediately look into these cases. There's a task force, they're unsolved homicides, and eventually he is linked positively to the deaths of those three girls. What was going on through your head when you found out that he had not only done this before, but the others did not escape? It has taken me a very long time to come to terms with what that means. He told me that he was going to let me go. And I honestly believed that because he wasn't violent and he right. wasn't aggressive with me, right? So yeah. I didn't have any reason to believe that he was going to kill me. But the logical side of my brain says, no, he would have killed you. I have a hard time with assigning emotions to how I felt through this process, mm -hmm. um, partially because my primary stress coping mechanism was compartmentalization and shutting mm -hmm. off those emotions. That was how I survived. Mm -hmm. And so for me to think about how I felt, I'm like. You didn't feel. I didn't feel. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel anything. That remained true for 15 years. Did the police immediately believe you when you told them your story about what just happened? I felt at the time like I wasn't believed. I didn't get to call my mom immediately and like the, the handcuff is left on. But years later, uh -huh. I went to work in law enforcement. Uh -huh. And so I learned a lot about law enforcement. It helped me to understand. What I've come to realize is he had a sense of disbelief. It's not that I don't believe you. It's that I can't believe this is happening. It's I don't, I, I can't fathom the situation. Exactly. My brain cannot comprehend what's going on. Mm. I've actually spoken to him since, and you know, he vividly recalls it. And there was never a sense of disbelief on his. He never doubted my story. Mm -hmm. He just was shocked. So that's why I say it's important to convey a sense of belief. That's mm. very often the first step right. in someone's healing journey. What happened to your father? Everyone likes to think that at the end of a story, like, 
the bad guy gets put away forever. That's not what happened. He got out on, you know, mental illness stuff. Ever since then, he has been living, you know, on the streets and he's still out there and he's not in jail. Does any part of you wish that he were in jail? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We like to think sometimes that there's good people and bad people, mm -hmm. but everybody's great. <laughs> when he said, I'm gonna take her to heaven, we're both going to heaven, it's implied, you know, initially, that's, I assumed, everyone assumed that that meant like, we're going to, you know, take lives here. <laughs> but then, you know, there's been times where I've like reconsidered what if he was talking about the theme park? Some people would consider that heaven. What if he just wanted to give me like the best day ever? Uh-huh. Like, I, I don't really know, but I mean, that's definitely not how you go about, go about it. But I don't know. I, I can't seem to get to the point where I'm like, okay, that's exactly what he was thinking. Mm. That's exactly why he did it. I mean, I still don't have those answers. For a long time, I would call my dad things like crazy, insane, psycho, because of his mental illness and because of how it played out. And it wasn't until I actually fell into a drug-induced psychosis when I fell into addiction and drugs. And I felt for the first time in my life what it felt like to not know the difference between reality and fantasy. I have a choice to make. Do I go get help for myself mm -hmm. or do I just continue with the choices that I'm making? And I made the right choice, which mm -hmm. was to go into recovery, get help for what I was experiencing, talk to professionals, get spiritual help, mm -hmm. and it saved my life. And now I don't look at him as crazy because I've been there. Has your father tried to contact you since then? <laughs> yeah, he still tries to contact me, but ominously. Through riddles. Through riddles. Like the Joker. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sends me puzzles in the mail, but almost every single time it doesn't make sense. He'll draw a little telescope on the postcard. He'll just have like, like the fill in the blanks with the letters. The telescope may be a representation of the thing that you were into at that time. Maybe. It seems like it does get spark a little bit of like excitement. I mean, I'm still related to him. Like I have the same curiosity for like yeah. the mystery that he always had. So would you say that you've forgiven? I don't feel like I was ever honestly angry enough that I feel the need to forgive. People hurt people. It's because they're broken. And I, to a pretty, pretty large degree never allowed him to have enough control over me that I felt angry. I think I forgave him in 2017 when I went through my experience and I understood the importance of forgiveness because forgiveness isn't for the other person. Forgiveness is for you. And it isn't until we re recognize the faults within ourselves that we're able to forgive fully the faults in other people. What do you think is the biggest way that that event impacted your life going forward? For me, I identified as being strong mm. and that meant that I was not affected by my trauma. Mm. So it didn't make me sad. I didn't think about it. I didn't have PTSD, mm. but it became this mantle that I put on that protected me, but it also kind of hid who I was, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It didn't allow me to feel. And so something that was a positive label became um, a weapon against me. But the one thing that I was feeling was very, very, very angry mm. at the world, at my kids, at my husband. Mm. And I just kind of peeled it back and peeled it back. Like, why am I so angry? Onions. Yeah, <laughs> layers of the onion. We're all big, beautiful, stinky onions, as the donkey says. Wisdom within that yes. donkey. I'll tell you. <laughs> Compartmentalization and emotional dissociation, mm -hmm. like shutting down those emotions, that was my coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. That was it. I was aware enough of what I was doing that I slowly began to stop it. If I felt like I was going to cry, I'd be like, no, I'm not gonna cry. I'm Instead strong. of just, right. Instead of just allowing it. And let me tell you, I'm a dadgum crybaby now. <laughs> I was like, I cry about everything. I'm like, why do I cry so much? I'm like, no wonder I was suppressing it. I just be crying all over the place. And I can't go without thanking Dipsy for sponsoring this episode. Dipsy is an app full of short audio stories designed by women 
for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, and new content is released every week. So in between listening to your favorite stories, you can always find something new to explore. Dipsy also has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and now they also offer written stories. So no matter what mood you're in or how you like to consume these delectable morsels, you're in luck. For I spend today with viewers and listeners of the podcast, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Badia. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash P-A-D-I-L-L-A. And no, I won't apologize for that rhyme. It was brilliant. Now, back to the world of surviving a kidnapping. What do you think it is that's drawn you to want to talk about your traumatic experiences publicly? It's really just like wanting to help people that are looking for something to relate to themselves and their experiences. Mm -hmm. Circumstances might look different, but everyone can relate to a struggle or joy or, you know, any emotion. And so mm -hmm. I really like being a person that makes those connections. What we all want to do is just connect and mm -hmm. and know that we're not alone. You started working in law enforcement. I you did. were offered a job there by yeah. one of the yeah. police officers that helped you. What was it that got you into wanting to do that? I started working there the summer after my kidnapping. I worked there for 12 years. I went on to work with um, sexual assault survivors mm -hmm. and investigated sexual assault cases. And I think it probably made me a better investigator because I was less likely to um, let go of cases. Because you knew that if your case had been let go, then right. it would've been a very different outcome. Yes, and then I went into victim services, and then I was actually really helping people where you know someone's been a victim and I get them counseling. So you were able to give them the support that you knew that you needed. Correct. What do you hope other people take from your experience? So often in life, we have things that happen to us. You can kind of get taken under or you can rise above, right? Like think mm -hmm. about it like surfing. The waves are coming. Mm -hmm. What are your options? You can try to fight them. You can't do that. But they're waves. They're, right, <laughs> yeah. right? Like they're just gonna keep coming, mm -hmm. right? So like that's kind of the hits in life. Mm -hmm. Like stuff just kind of, it's going to happen. But what if you grab your surfboard and you rise above and you surf it? The fact of the matter is that you're gonna have hard moments, you're gonna have great moments. And if it weren't for the hard things that you go through, you can't appreciate the good things. What is the general response to your kidnapping story? This is how it always goes, okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. say like, hey, I've been kidnapped. Okay, I'll be you? Am yeah. I you? Okay, yeah. hey, I've been kidnapped. <gasps> oh my God. I am so, so sorry. I had no idea. People just don't know how to react in person. Yeah. It's immediately just like, wow, that's heavy. And that's why I don't just walk up to people on the street and be like, hey, I've been kidnapped. Oh, really? You but don't I, have a sign on your chest that no. says, hi, I'm kidnapped? You know, I don't say that to people in person, you know, every day. Yeah. But I tell millions of people on the internet, the connection is a little bit more from a safe distance. People don't, like, they're not in the room with me yeah. and not looking me in the actual eyes yeah. when I tell them I've been kidnapped. It's like less pressure and they feel more like, okay, now I want to hear the whole story. So there. online, they're they're curious. They want to know the story. Yeah, I think it's yeah. cool that people are curious about experiences. Uh -huh. Experiences that we normally label as traumatic. The number one response I get is, I'm so sorry. I hated that. That was the number one reason why I didn't tell people. You don't want pe people to feel sorry for you? Right. When someone says, I'm so sorry that happened. What's your automatic response? Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's, uh, yeah, it was fine. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine right? It wasn't that big of a deal. So it takes the burden and puts it back on the person, puts you in this awkward position of having to like validate that you're okay. Mm -hmm. And like, what if you're not okay? There's no good response yeah. from the person who is sharing the vulnerable thing to I'm sorry versus, wow. Thank you for sharing that with me. Mm -hmm. You should be really proud of what you did. Like, you're really amazing that you got through that. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of become a platform of one of the things that I help to people to understand is, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, you know, I understand that you do that because you want to convey affection and love for that person. But there are other ways to do it that can also empower. What are some of the wildest comments that you get in response to your story? There's been a lot of people that tell me I'm lying about my own story. They tell like, they, you you're they've lying. They've commented on my videos. They haven't like told me to my face. I mean, it might as well. You have to read it. It's there in your comments. You have to read your comments. <laughs> because I have a different name on my Amber Alert. Yeah. You know, they're like, that wasn't you. You're just using someone else. Because it was a parent and it's not what their idea of kidnapping is. It, they 
assume that it wasn't a real kidnapping, huh. that there was no danger involved because it was my dad. And you went to an amusement park. And that's the kind of the biggest thing. It used yeah. to really bother me. Yeah. And I've had to accept it when people would say, I wish my dad would kidnap me and take me to an amusement park. That's one that I've actually heard a lot. It's like, you don't, you don't say that. Yeah. And I've never forgotten it. 98% are just positive, yeah. amazing. But you know, I got one today that said, just die. In, um, in response to hearing about your kidnapping story. Correct. Yeah. Mm, I don't know. I got another one recently that said, oh, it's always the annoying ones that survive. And my immediate response was, well, you must have survived something terrible oh, then. Oh my God. Um, I don't remember them because I yeah. see them and I just kind of go, and then I report them. Right? <laughs> then you walk them and you're like, I've, you're on my account. I, right, exactly. Get off. Like, you came here. Yeah. It's like if you walk into someone's house, you're like, I hate everything. <laughs> it's like, you came here. Like, I just, I see these comments and I feel sorry for them. If there's anyone watching who has experienced being kidnapped themselves, is there anything that you want to say to them? Forgiveness is going to set you free. If you continue to replay a memory or an experience or something that happened to you or something that's happening between you and someone else and it feels like there is unrest with that situation, please, please pursue forgiveness. You have done absolutely the best that you could with a terrible situation. Just give yourself the grace and the space to heal and rest and do the best that you can. Healing is not a linear journey. Mm -hmm. You don't just go from point A to point B and there's really no destination. Mm -hmm. Like you don't ever arrive. You're not ever like, I'm healed. Uh, oh, feels so good to be healed <laughs> Right, now. like I have no more problems. It's a lifelong journey. Do the best you can and you just keep going. I spent a day with kidnapping survivors. And one thing that really sits with me is the idea that our traumatic experiences from our past don't have to hold us captive forever. And while my experiences are entirely different, accepting the painful memories from my past as just that, things that only exist in the past, I've been able to disconnect from those memories and instead live life more fully in the present. I watch your Smosh Pokemon videos, so. The Pokemon in real life videos? Yeah. <laughs> so you know that they are amazing and that my acting is great. Yeah. Who's your favorite Pokemon? Blastoise, because he had oh bazookas on his back. I mean, how sick is that? I know. <laughs> that cool. And Zapdos, yeah, because I mean, and why choose gotta, one of them one when you can have them all? Gotta catch them all. You gotta, gotta catch all of them. <laughs> you must catch all of them. No matter how expensive, no matter how deep you need to get in your wallet, you need to catch all of them. When you catch a Pokemon, it's kind of like kidnapping. True. 